John Grabowski um, is our speaker tonight, and I'm assuming that most of us are here to hear what he has to say. But <clears throat> he's a PhD, a professor, an author, and a noted Cleveland historian. He specializes in areas of immigration, Cleveland urban history, and public history, particularly in the fields of museums and archives. Dr. Wabowski holds a joint appointment at Case Western, as well as the Historical Society. And if I don't put my glasses on, I'm not going to be able to see the rest of it. He's also Senior Vice President for Research and Publications. Um, one of the things I learned before as I was speaking to him, to kind of introduce myself, and, and learn who he is and what he's done, <clears throat> and shared a couple of tidbits, is his enthusiasm and love of baseball. It goes back to when his father played, and when he was an inspiring, wanted to be a pitcher, turned out to be uh, an outfielder, because somebody got to catch the ball. And I have no doubt that he's going to hit it out of the park tonight. So, John, we look forward to your presentation and everything you're going to do. Thank you. I, I, I think I'm lapel mic'd. Am I uh, hearable? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I may wander off to the side so you can better see the uh, slide presentation or the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, what, what I didn't tell Bob, um, and, and perhaps my name should have been Bob because there would have been three of us, uh, <laughs> so it would have been, is that my father's nickname when he played baseball was Ben Grab a Whiskey. Uh, and, and, and there's a long story behind that. I promise not tonight, to, tonight not to go into too many personal stories, but there are some personal stories that need to come up in this topic. Uh, because I've been associated with the Cleveland Jewish Archives and the Western Reserve Historical Society for quite some time. The archives is now under the uh, leadership and direction of Dr. Sean Martin, who you'll meet here. Uh, and you'll be able to visit some parts of the archives. Uh, but I'm, I'm deeply honored because this is, yes? Mike? Ah. Is they're having trouble with the mic? Okay, let's, let's move it up here. Put it up here. You want to put it on my bow tie? There we go. Hang on. This is, this is getting to be fun. This is my, uh, okay. Am I, do am I doing good? Is this better? Okay, fine. I'll try to speak to my, uh, to my right. Uh, which is the mic that you're listening to. Uh, what deeply honors me about being here is this is about legacy. And, and my presentation tonight is, is about legacy, uh, the different forms that legacy can take. Uh, but there's a personal connection to legacy. Uh, as you heard in my introduction from Bob, I, I'm an academic at a university and I work for a museum. So I work for an educational institution and a not-for-profit cultural institution. Without legacy, I wouldn't have a job. Without legacy, those institutions wouldn't exist. Without legacy, how, how are we doing? Okay, I'll do that. That's fine. Okay, that's great. It's, uh, I, okay. You need a repetition on this. Uh, I, I feel totally connected. I have so much electronics in me. I'm afraid that if there's an electrical storm, you'll lose your speaker. But I did want to talk about legacy, and it is to get very, very serious and very personal, because without legacy, things like the Cleveland Jewish Archive would not exist. Uh, and, and very personally, as I said before, if you didn't hear it, my, my positions, my career, my life, the things I love to do, I'm capable to do, the things I'm sharing with you tonight would not be possible. Uh, so those who contribute to legacy, monetarily or otherwise, are, are very, very dear to me and to the people I work with. Uh, the other talk, the other point about this talk is that I am taking millennia of history of the Jewish community and compressing it into less than a half an hour. And I'm focusing it down to one particular Jewish experience, the Jewish experience in Northeastern Ohio. And when I compress that down into Northeastern Ohio in 30 minutes, there are several things I want to do. One, I want to make certain we all understand that the Jewish experience in Northeastern Ohio is part of broader experiences. It's part of the growth 
the infrastructure and this, of this community. It's also part of many national movements. So I want to do that, but I'm going to explore this through some personal stories of individuals. And I had to select people. I guess I'm the historian, so I got to do the selection. Uh, and, and the selections, I think, illustrate people who were important in many ways. Some may be well known to you, some may not be known to you, but I think they all have stories that you'll enjoy. Okay, am I losing one more electronic here? There we go. Okay, there. Okay, I want to, uh, the first stop on, on the long journey I'm going to talk to you about today starts in the uh, province of Franconia, which is in Bavaria, which is in modern day Germany. It's a town called Unsleben. And uh, somebody said, uh, turn down the lights? Okay. I don't, I don't want to do that. This is a, I'm too connected already. We'll let this sit and the lights will go down and Franconia will be illuminated. Right. Well, Franconia and Unsleben will be illuminated. But Uns Unsleben is, is, is a sleepy little town. Its population today is about 1,000 people. Uh, but Unsleben in the 1820s and 1830s was home to a large Jewish population. And, and that Jewish population, like Jews all throughout Germany, were infected with something called the America fever. Uh, and, and for various reasons, America was attractive to them. One reason was the fact that for a brief period under the Napoleonic regimes, they had enjoyed some sense of freedom. But after Metternich and Vienna, a lot of their freedoms began to be diminished. Marriage was problematic. The trades they could engage in were problematic. Things were regulated. And the word of America got around all through Germany, or what would become Germany at that time. There were newspapers called Auswanderung Zeitungen, uh, newspapers that totally covered the news about what was happening in America and how you could best get there. And even before the group I'm going to talk about left, there were people who had left Unsleben to go to the United States. And when they left, they did something that every migrant does, because the story of the Unsleben immigrants is a universal story. They left a home, they left memories, and I always wondered how difficult it is for one to leave the place where one's ancestors are buried. And this is the cemetery in Unsleben. It has survived, which is rather remarkable if you consider the history of Germany in the 20th century. So when they began to leave, when they caught the America fever, uh, they were throwing a lot behind, but they were reminded to take something with them. I'm going to read this for you because it's small type. They had a rabbi, a teacher actually, his name was Lazarus Cohn. Uh, Lazarus Cohn had seen others leave, but there was a party of 18 who were about to depart under the leadership of a man named Moses Osbacher. And Cohn wrote this letter to them, and you will see a facsimile of this. It's known as the Osbacher document. You saw it on the cover of your invitation. Here it goes. My dear friends, Moses and Yetta Osbacher, I give you by way of saying goodbye a list of names of the people of your faith with the dearest wish that you may present these names to your future heirs. Yes, even to your great grandchildren, of which may you have many, under the best family relationship and under pleasant economic circumstances. I further wish and hope that the Almighty, who reigns over the ocean as well as over dry land, to whom thunder and storms must pay heed, shall give you good angels as travel companions so that you, my dear friends, may arrive undisturbed and healthy in body and soul at the place of your destiny in the land of freedom. But I must also, as a, as a friend, ask a favor of you. Friends, you are traveling to a land of freedom where the opportunity will be presented to live without compulsory religious education. Resist and withstand this tempting freedom. And do not turn away from the religion of our fathers. Do not throw away your holy religion for quickly lost earthly pleasures, because your religion brings you consolation and quiet in this life, and it will bring you happiness for certain in the other life. The promise to remain good Jews may never and should never be broken during the trip, nor in your home life, nor when you go to sleep, nor when you rise again, nor in the raising of your children. And now, my dear friends, have a pleasant trip. 
and forgive me for these honest words to which the undersigned will forever remain true. Your friend Lazarus Cohn, teacher, Unsleben near Neustadt an der Saale in Lower Franconia in the Kingdom of Bavaria, the 5th of May, 1839. This is a form of an ethical testament. I, when I talk about the Alsbacher document, I always go to the audience and say, how many of you have written ethical testaments or have received one? They're an old tradition. And this, this one is incredible, and more about it later. Ah, that's good. The other one's vodka. <laughs> oh, I'm about ready to step up. This is a, we will put this in my pocket. And uh, if I walk out with this federation, we'll lose half of its electronic equipment. So there's a backstory to this. Uh, the man here, this is Moses Alsbacher, the, uh, the leader of the Alsbacher group, 18 people. Uh, this is an Unslebenite, if I might call him that, uh, named Simpson Thorman, who had made it to the United States before the group came there, and he was the one who carried or sent the news to Unsleben to encourage further emigration. And he was, and he's an interesting guy. Um, I, I like, he's kind of like the Daniel Boone of early Jewish immigrants. Uh, he, he ends up in the United States, uh, goes to St. Louis, he deals in hides and skins, comes back, he knocks about a bit, and he comes into this little community on Lake Erie called Cleveland. Uh, he thinks Cleveland's a happening city, if I can put it in the contemporary verbiage. Uh, and, and so he suggests that the people from Udenslaven join him in Cleveland, and 15 of the 18 who come do join him in Cleveland, and they start a community here. I, I, I love the picture of Simpson Thorman. He would go on to be a city councilman in Cleveland. Together, these men, but particularly uh, Simpson, they would found the Israelitic Society of Cleveland, which would eventually become Anche Chesed Congregation. Uh, he would start the first uh, B'nai B'rith organization in Cleveland, and they would create the first Jewish cemetery in Cleveland, Willett Street Cemetery, which you can see. So the origins of what I am looking at now, you, this community, is in this group. It's not that there were not Jews here before. I would be a bad historian to say that these were the first. There was a Sephardim here. His name was Daniel Pashoto. He was, a, he was an instructor at the Willoughby Medical College in the 1830s. So you begin to find these, but this is the key to the community. They come ready to settle. Uh, they have a shochet and they have a moil. Uh, they're, they're ready to set up a community, not to go home. And what do they come to? They come to a little bit of New England. This is a picture, a painting of Cleveland's Public Square in 1839. The, uh, the Cleveland Grays are parading on the square. It's, it's a little bit of New England. They have come to a very Protestant town, a uh, town where there are a few Catholics uh, who are filtering in, but they're the first real group of Jews to come here. And, and Cleveland begins to prosper in the 1830s. Uh, and, and one would think they came at a great time, but when I think about their arrival, they came in 1839, which was two years after the great financial panic of 1837. It took the United States almost a decade to get over the effects of that panic. Constriction of credit, bankruptcies, it, it was one of the great fiscal disasters of the early republic. So that's one of the things we don't, we don't really think about, is when they're settling here and setting up businesses, it's not the most propitious time to be in the United States. But yet they make it. So this is a, if I could read this, this is a, I have no money and cannot get any work. Uh, this one is, Father, could I have a piece of bread? Uh, I'm so hungry, and my dear, I, she's saying something to him, and here's the man coming to collect the rent. Uh, so this is an 1837 uh, panic cartoon. So this is the world they come into. But things will get better. This is a picture from the archives at the Historical Society. Now that's, that's another story here. We'd be here for an hour if I told you everything that was in the archives, and I could only scratch at the surface. Uh, this is the Ohio and Erie Canal. Uh, and the picture is from 1859. And how many of you have been down the canal towpath? Okay. I, I bike down there regularly, so I might hit you if you're walking on the towpath trail. But that canal, when it was completed in the 1830s, connected Cleveland on Lake Erie to Portsmouth on the Ohio River. But you have to think big. The other ends of the canal, you could follow the Great Lakes over the Erie Canal to the Hudson River to New York and back to Europe. 
And on the other end, you can go from Portsmouth to Cincinnati to St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico. So they're suddenly, they are located in a community that is going to prosper. It's in the right place. And when it does prosper, particularly after the Civil War, we come into the era of entrepreneurship. So my, my question is, how many of you recognize this gentleman? It's John D. Rockefeller. Uh, so he, he perhaps is the entrepreneur of Cleveland's Gilded Age. I can throw numbers at you. The Jewish community is also growing at this time, but Cleveland has roughly 40,000 people at the beginning of the Civil War. By 1870, I get paid to remember this, by the way. It's 130,000 people. It's 300,000 people in 1900. And by 1920, Cleveland has nearly 800,000 people. It is the fifth largest city in the United States. The value of its industrial production is also fifth largest. This is the world that the community enters into. So this is one entrepreneur, Rockefeller. This is his refinery, Standard Oil Refinery Number One. And by the way, up the hill here is the Woodland Avenue Jewish community. And by the time this picture was made in 1888, things were not smelling too good in that community. <laughs> Let's look at some entrepreneurs who come afterwards. These are Jewish entrepreneurs. This is Kaufman Hayes. His story will come in a second. Uh, in a second, and Morris Black. Uh, they arrived, Kaufman Hayes arrives in the 1850s. Morris Black, one of his family members, is the first Hungarian Jew to come to Cleveland, Louis, uh, Louis Black, in the 1850s. He's a grand nephew of Louis Black. Uh, they both prosper. Morris, Morris's family actually goes to Toledo, but then he comes back to Cleveland. I've got a little secret to tell you about the Black family that I learned from Alan Gross this afternoon. Uh, but let's look at Kaufman Hayes. He's in a place called Storndorf, Germany. The family is large and poor. His mother has died. Uh, he tries to make money wherever he can. He's trying to save up to come to the United States. A couple of his sisters go first. They send some money back. He scrapes enough money back to get on a boat and come to the US. He, he gets better food on the boat because he knows how to slaughter sheep and he gets actually employed by the people on the boat to help them with uh, meal service. He comes to Cleveland, and, and the story here, there's a little autobiography of him that you need to read, and it's in a book called Remembering Cleveland's Jewish Voices. Uh, one job after another small, he's a peddler. His, his territory's out Mayfield Road. He makes friends, he remembers that one woman would send him a pumpkin pie every year. Eventually, he grows beyond that. He gets into the close, uh, retail clothing sale business. He becomes a banker. Uh, Morris Black also gets into the clothing business in a company that eventually becomes Prince Biederman. So I want, want to go from that. So this is Gilded Age Cleveland. This is a document in the uh, archives. This is the subscription book for the Euclid Avenue National Bank of Cleveland. When national banks were uh, made possible by the federal government, a group of Clevelanders got together to buy stock to create a bank that would be capitalized at $1 million. And if you look at this, uh, you'll find Charles F. Brush, famous name in Cleveland, Benjamin Rose, the Benjamin Rose Institute, Charles George Pack, these are Rufus P. Rainey. Uh, you'll find uh, Myron T. Herrick on another page, but right here, what you find is Kaufman Hayes. He's one of the founders of the bank. He eventually becomes an officer of the bank. This becomes part of the Union Trust Company. So he becomes one of the wealthiest Jews, if not the wealthiest Jew in Cleveland, rising from a peddler, could hardly get to the United States. Morris Black's secret? Ah, that's a good one. When the Federation was first started in 1903, one of his first major bequests to uh, actually support student scholarships came from Mrs. H. Black, Mrs. Herman Black, Morris Black's father. So this, is, this goes back to that. So Federation's bequests begin out of this. And what we see here in Cleveland, and there's some pictures over on the table that you can look at later, but you can't look at now. In Cleveland in 1870 is all about chemicals and oil and petroleum. Cleveland in the 1880s and 1890s begins to be all about iron and steel. That's why we hate Pittsburgh. Uh, that's another story. The, uh, and then Cleveland by the 1880s and 1890s is also about garments and clothing manufacturers. Now, Dr. Sean Martin, who is 
the archivist for the Cleveland Jewish Archives is, has written, a, a, we're going to be publishing a new book on the history of the garment industry in Cleveland. And, and it is one of the largest garment industries in the United States, almost second to that of New York. It's a story you don't hear. And it's mostly a Jewish industry. It is mostly a Jewish industry. So Gilded Age Cleveland, providing jobs and growth, stretches from the barons of the iron and steel houses, like the Mathers, to the barons of the garment industry, which is a very dicey industry. This is, I believe, the Latin and Bloomfield skirt factory. And of course, when you create jobs, you create needs for workers, and Cleveland grows. And I gave you the statistics, but let's look at some pictures of what happens when a city grows. This is a Lower Woodland Avenue, 1905. This is near this, this is where, uh, this is pretty near where uh, uh, Quick and Loans Arena is right now. That's the edge of the flats. Uh, the caption on this in 1905 is a home for five families. A survey of this neighborhood in the early 1900s showed 15 bathtubs for 5,000 people. Now this, this was a pre-plumbing neighborhood that just grew too fast, but it was a neighborhood that, that, that was Jewish, it became Slovak, it became African-American, it became Italian, it was mixture. Uh, Cleveland is, is a city of very many, many nationalities, but as it grows, there are issues. And the question is, how do you deal with the issues of industrial America? The progressive era, late 1890s into the 1910s, uh, progressive era, find, trying to find a way to find peace between capital and labor, to find a more equitable way for workers to earn a living, to cure the ills of growing cities, to provide charity and philanthropy where needed, uh, reinventing urban life. So I want to give you pictures of two local, one local pro progressive and one <coughs> national progressive, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the very progressive uh, president of the United States. Can I, can I depart here for a side? The, the great story about Teddy Roosevelt is that he was parked as the vice president under William McKinley. That was something the political kingmaker from Cleveland, Marcus Hanna, did because they really didn't want Roosevelt, this young upstart, to have any power. Uh, the problem was that McKinley was assassinated a year later. And, and, Rose, and Hanna was heard to say, now, now that damned cowboy is president. Uh, it sort of upset his political spectrum. But in Cleveland, this is Tom L. Johnson, the streetcar magnate who became a, a huge advocate of municipal ownership and of reform. So Cleveland is noted as one of the most progressive cities in the United States, and it's also Jewish progressivism. This is Martin L. Marks. He came to Cleveland from Milwaukee. He married one of Kaufman Hayes' daughters. Uh, he was an insurance salesman, partially banker, and he eventually became part of the governing structure of the Cleveland Worsted Mills. But Marx moved in circles outside of the Jewish community. I'm going to complicate things for you here. Marx was a very wealthy man. He was a member of the Chamber of Commerce. And in the Chamber of Commerce, he created something called the committee, he chaired it, the Committee of uh, Benevolent Societies, which would grow into the Federation for Charity and Philanthropy in 1913, today's United Way, and uh, what used to be the Welfare Federation. But he was also one of the founders of the Cleveland Jewish Federation in 1903. He was a progressive organizer, looking at ways to meet the needs of the community, both the Jewish community and the general community. Now you would think, since he was on the Chamber of Commerce and creating all these things, that, that he had open access to everything in Cleveland. No. Nope. In 1872, Cleveland's wealthy men created something called the Union Club. And, and several months afterwards, <laughs> Cleveland's Jewish men created their own club, the Excelsior Club. There's no question as to why they needed to create their own club. So despite where Marx was, he was living in a world, despite his success, of increasing what we would call social anti-Semitism at that time, being blackballed out of clubs. So this is the home of the Excelsior Club when it was at 37th and Woodland Avenue. But Martin Marx is one of the figures in Cleveland history who doesn't get the due he needs. He's a transitional, transformative figure. Women and philanthropy in progressive Cleveland. It's Gray's Armory, it's 1896, and this is the beehive of the Cleveland section of the National Council of Jewish Women. 
And what did the National Council of Jewish Women did is they emulated Jane Addams. They started a social settlement for the Jewish community in Cleveland, which was known as the Consul Educational Alliance, which is today's JCC over there. So you begin to see this working. Uh, the topics and speakers you can't read, but they were doing very progressive things. One talk was on the boy problem. <laughs> okay, the boy problem. I wish I were there to listen to that one. By Rabbi Moses Grease. Another one on juvenile delinquency. Another one, should the working people's education stop at the public school? The immigrant and citizenship, the education of the citizen. This is all heady, progressive stuff. And, and it, it worked in Cleveland. But there were other people who come out of the Jewish community in Cleveland who see inequities. They want to help solve the problems of the world. And I would argue that part of what Lazarus Cohn was asking everyone to remember was to deal with inequity and inequality. And this is Rose Pastor Stokes. She wrote an essay called, I Belong to the Working Class. Now, she's really interesting. You ready for this one? Uh, she comes over as a young girl, family settles in New York, and by the time she's, I think, about age 11, they come to Cleveland, and she goes to work. She gets a job for 12 years in a cigar factory, rolling cigars. She finds out that she can write. Uh, she writes very well, and her essays begin to be published in the Jewish Daily Forward. She moves to New York, and in New York in 1903, she is asked to uh, interview Mr. Rod. Uh, G. J. W. Uh, Phelps Stokes, a wealthy Episcopalian whose family made a fortune in railroads and mines. And she goes to interview him in 1903, and she's smitten by him. And, and she marries him. And they together become sort of a force of reform and pressure in New York. She participates in strikes. She's radical, hugely radical. She's a socialist. And in, during the First World War, she is, eventually, she is accused of being disloyal. She is going to be sent to prison. The case is appealed. She gets out of prison. She becomes, dare I say, one of the founders of the American Communist Movement. So there are all these little things that are going on here. But there she is, girl who rolled cigars in Cleveland. World War I. We'll move you to the present eventually. Uh, it's taken very seriously in Cleveland. You can see by the one poster uh, that is to your left. The item to the right is one of the collections that came very early into the Cleveland Jewish Archives. It's written by an immigrant who was uh, born in Lithuania in 1889. His name was Max Sandin. And uh, Max Sandin uh, was a conscientious objector in World War I, and he was sentenced to be executed. Sentence was then changed to a prison sentence. He eventually was let out of prison, but for his entire life, he was a pacifist. And even until his, almost the years of his death in the 1960s, Max Sandin would be found protesting income taxes if they were being used for war. Now, you may or may not agree with him, but he had a moral compass that he held true to. Uh, I was born June 3, 1889 in Dvinsk, the county seat in the state of uh, Vitelsk, Lithuania, Russia. Dvinsk had a population of 60,000. About 75% were Jewish. There were a match factory, employed 1,000 workers, most of them women. There were two tanneries with five 1,500 workers, one tile factory employing 600 workers, a railroad engine shop with 3,000 Gentile workers, a large knitting industry, and numerous small shops. And then he goes on to tell his life story. Again, not my story, not your story, but one of the many stories that make this community so very, very interesting and historically relevant. The war is over. This is an era that people call the return to normalcy. This is 1925. It's Washington, and the Klan is marching. There are a lot of myths we live with about the Roaring Twenties or this era or that, but pick them apart, and particularly if you're Jewish. By this time, the Klan had been reborn. It was exterminated in the 1870s. It came back in 1915. And, and I say this with... with with all seriousness, it, it, it had spread its hate from blacks to Jews to immigrants to Catholics. It was a potent power in politics at that point. And then there's this in the 1920s. Published in 1921 in, New, in uh, Dearborn, Michigan by Henry Ford, the Dearborn Independent. How many of you have heard of the Dearborn Independent? 
virulently anti-Semitic newspaper, published the, proto elders, the pro uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Uh, in Cleveland, there was a reaction to it. They actually got it banned from being distributed in Cleveland. But here, you see one of the usual canards, the peril of baseball, too much Jew. Now, I want to move you to football, not my favorite sport, but in any case, uh, I'm looking at Bob Grease here, and I have to say that with some caution. Uh, this, is, this is a guy from Glenville. His name's Benny Friedman. Ben, Benny Friedman was named, this is the 1920s, this is always, this is one of these things that really gets me going as a historian. He's named to the All-American football team at the same time the Klan is marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. The story of sports and ethnicity and religion and belonging is so incredibly important. And so here's Friedman. Um, he played, I have to say, as my father-in-law is a Buckeye, so he played for the other university, the one up north. I'm, I'm prohibited. <laughs> I lose my family legacy if I say this, you know that. Uh, but there's Friedman. Friedman would go on. Uh, Cleveland experimented with professional football teams in the 1920s. Almost all of them were started by Jewish entrepreneurs. They almost all failed. They all failed, except to, until the Rams came in the 30s. There were the Cleveland Indians, the Cleveland Panthers, the Cleveland Bulldogs. And the Cleveland Bulldogs thought they could get a great audience if they brought in this college phenom, Benny Friedman. So they were known as Benny Friedman's Cleveland Bulldogs. And Friedman was making $18,000 a year at that time, which is a good chunk of change. He would eventually go on to play for Tim Mara's Giants, and then he would become the athletics director at City College in New York and at Brandeis. The story of Jews and sport in Northeastern Ohio is very, very important. It is very, very important in terms of identity and maintaining identity. I believe it was Max Bayer, the great heavyweight boxer, boxed with the Star of David on his trunks. He was a hero to everybody who was Jewish in the 1930s, the same way that Joe Lewis was a hero to black youth in the 1930s. Sports are a powerful thing. The 1930s, all kinds of images about the 30s. This is a, this is a Cleveland picture. Cleveland's unemployment in the 1930s reached 30% at one point. This is not a Cleveland picture, but when the, the country is under stress, all sorts of radical solutions begin popping up, don't they? And, and so there's Father Coughlin, the priest, anti-Semitic priest in Detroit. Uh, you have the Bund movement growing. Look what Germany's doing. The Communist Party is growing. Huey Long is out there raising heck. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt is trying to govern the whole mess. But this picture is particularly powerful because it's a precursor of what many in the Jewish community know is happening in Germany. And so I bring you to the man who needs no introduction in this audience, Abba Hillel Silver, with Raphael and Daniel, Raphael and Daniel. And, and this, this picture is Silver comes to the temple in 1917. There are a lot of stories about change. It, by the temple, Tefereth Israel, is in the early years of the 20th century on the extreme edge of reform. Services are held on Sunday. Hebrew prayer is not there. Silver comes in, he's a Zionist, and he begins to move it back more toward the middle and the mainstream at that point. But what Silver is more important for, when I look at him, he's there in the 1930s, and two things I'll talk to you about Silver. He's a social reformer. He looks at the Depression, and he becomes an advocate for unemployment insurance. He becomes pro-labor. He's a working man's advocate. But also in the 1930s, after 1933, he and many other people know what's happening in Germany and what's going to happen. So he helps begin what is called the League for Human Rights. National organization with the Cleveland branch. And the League for Human Rights advocates a boycott of goods produced in Nazi Germany. They try to trace people who are on the extreme right and to expose them. Uh, they try to educate the American public about Nazi Germany. They have to do it carefully, though. The League of Human Rights has what I would call two boards, one the governing board, and then one's the letterhead board. The letterhead board are some Jews, but a number of forward-thinking Gentiles. So in order to get the message to a broader audience outside the Jewish community, that little bit of, of finesse had to be added. But that's, what, that's silver. We remember him for Israel. We remember him for the United Nations. We remember him for the tragedy of his death. 
He was going to preach a sermon uh, upon the death. John Kennedy was killed on November 22, 1963. Silver was preparing a, a sermon on Kennedy's death, and he died before he could deliver that sermon. Uh, one of the giants of the Cleveland Jewish community, any community. He's one of the great international figures of Cleveland, right along there with you know, Myron T. Herrick, other people that you, you know, Abba Hillel Silver is, is simply there. The war is over, right? Uh, new beginnings. Uh, in a longer lecture, I would argue that, every, that so much of what we are today is about what World War II meant and what it exposed. So we go from that to after the war. Two disparate figures, but they have a binding. This is 1937. This is Telsha, Lithuania. These are the students at the yeshiva for Purim. We know what happened to Lithuania, first the Soviets and then the Nazis. Two of the rabbis happened to be out of the country, and Telsha comes to Cleveland in 1941. The rabbinical college of Telsha, as you know, is the descendant. One of the most remarkable objects that we have on display there is a box of candles from Telsha. So this is Jewish education at one level, and this is Libby Braverman. Okay. You knew it was Libby. And, and, and Lib, Libby was born to, uh, his, her father was an Orthodox rabbi. She was born in Massachusetts. And as she describes it, as the daughter of an Orthodox rabbi, they kept moving because they depended on the congregations for support. They ended up in Montreal. And she finally ended up in Cleveland, where she began to study education. And then she, she was uh, studying in the normal school. And then goes to uh, Ansh Hesed, Yucca Temple, gets a job in education there. And she is the one who is central in reintroducing Hebrew into many reform congregations. If you read her works, this is, these are changes that are going on. She's nationally known for her curriculum. More changes. We're into the 1960s. This is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. This is Rabbi Abba, I'm sorry, Arthur Lullyveld. It is Hattiesburg, Mississippi. It's Freedom Summer, 1964. He has gone down with other clerics to help register black people to vote. And he's taken after by two guys with a tire iron. And, and so he suffers for that. And there's something I, I want to read for you here. Because if I don't read it, I will remember it badly. Uh, hopefully my, my glasses are up to the trick here. Otherwise, it's a new prescription. Uh, this, this is. I, he is a pacifist. He's a conscientious objector. As a matter of fact, when I looked at Max Sandin's papers, when Max was doing poorly late in his life, guess who was writing letters of support for him? Arthur Lelyveld. Lelyveld's sermon recalled something he said about the civil rights, or his, I'm sorry, his obituary in the New York Times recalled something that, that he had said. I do not serve the cause of Negro emancipation because I expect the Negro to love me in return. The command to remember the stranger and the oppressed is unconditional. That is part, I would argue, not being a Jew, but I would argue that is implicit in remembering the religion of your fathers in the new country. That's another legacy. That's an important legacy. I'm sorry, I'm a child of the 60s, so you get a lot of reform here. But this is, this is an incredible picture. And on the table there, you will have the typescript copy of the sermon he delivered on his return to Cleveland. That's what the archives does. It saves these things that are so central. It saves things that need to be saved in an era when there are so many falsehoods around. When so much is said but not backed up. That's what archives and museums do. And his sermon is powerful. It's just as powerful as Max Sandin's statement. It's just as powerful as that subscription book to the uh, Euclid National Bank. Women's liberation, women's rights. National Organization of Women. Does anybody recognize this person? Lana Moreski? Oh I, I found that on a BBYO page. So you begin, if you look at all the reform movements that are percolating in the United States in the 50s and 60s, whether you agree with them or not, the Jewish community takes leadership. It takes this seriously. The oppressed, the unequal. That's a huge legacy. Another legacy, Lou, Rosen, uh, Ro Lou Rosenblum. 
one of the founders of the Cleveland Council on Soviet Anti-Semitism. Rosenblum was a, uh, a NASA scientist, as was Abe Silverstein. He was a member of Beth Israel, West Temple. And in 1964, they, they looked, 63 actually, they, they began, they were concerned with what was happening to Jews in Russia. And they, they felt that what could happen there would be the same thing that happened in Germany. And so they began a grassroots movement in Cleveland that became national and international. The archives of this group are with the Western Reserve Historical Society's Cleveland Jewish Archives. And so this is, a, this is one of the, the protests, and, and this is Lou, who's just, a fantastic guy. He's, he's in a retirement home in Boston right now. He just lost, lost his wife, Evie. And when I get personal, one of the things I remember in all my years at the Historical Society is that Evie and Lou were there constantly volunteering, processing records, working with the archives, making sure that the past lived on. And I dearly miss Evie, and I dearly miss not seeing Lou in that room working. So these stories do, really do come home. Two other stories. I'm going to start, <laughs> I know. I'll start with Sidney Vincent, <laughs> the executive director, would rise to a Glenville boy, a Glenville teacher. His story is very, very interesting. Read uh, personal and professional, his autobiography. He's at Western Reserve University. He wants to go into graduate school, wants to study, and the professors try to discourage him. And you know why? Because they didn't see a future for a Jewish boy there. But, but he would go on, and he was one of the people who really looked at Cleveland's changing demographics and housing segregation. His reports to the Federation are incredibly important for understanding the city. But Sidney was also a historian, co-author with Judah Rubenstein of Merging Traditions, Jewish Life in Cleveland. And this is Judah Rubenstein, a very young Judah Rubenstein. And, and this, 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 is, uh, this, this is something where I want, want to bring myself into this. Uh, when the Jewish archives began, when we first began collecting in the Jewish community, it was part of a broader ethnic archives initiative. And I wanted to collect in the Jewish community. Here I am, a goy in the Jewish community. And my friend, uh, Lois Scharf at uh, Case Western Reserve said, I know some people at the Council, uh, uh, National Council of Jewish Women. Why don't you go talk to them? And I convinced them to turn their papers over to the Historical Society. That began things. And then somebody said, well, you've got to see Mr. Rubenstein at Federation, Mr. Rubenstein. And so I went in and I met Judah Rubenstein, and at that point, uh, long hair, big mustache, and whatever else, uh, committed to preserving everybody's records. And, and I talked to Judah, and, and he was kind of like, you know, the historical society? And, and yes, he was, along with Howard Berger and Sidney, uh, they were the ones who began to create the basis for the Cleveland Jewish Archives. I'll go back to, to uh, to Judah in a few minutes, because he's, he's the lead into the next, the next slide and to the ending of this presentation. But the thing that, about, that, that I remember uh, uh, about this is that we started just with no money, and then in 76 we had a project, and today we have an archives that is endowed. The art endowment is held here at Federation. Uh, we are looking at names, and I want to make sure I've got these absolutely right. We're looking at the Ratner, and the Grease, and the Myers family, uh, we're looking at uh, Sally Wertheim. We're looking at uh, Barbara and Earl Franklin. Looking at the family of Lottie, Sh Lottie Shriver Pincus, uh, all of them, and the Lample family who provided money for the endowment. And we're also looking at Judah Rubenstein because when he passed, he left money for the endowment. Judah was a mensch. He was a mensch. Uh, my memories of Judah are going to Mama Santa's <laughs> for wine and antipasto after meetings at the historical site. Judah played tennis, Judah played golf, Judah collected classical music. Some of his RCA Red Seal records were given to my wife, Diane, and myself. Judah would come to our house, and we'd have strawberries and cream. Uh, Judah, Judah would listen to look at my wife's opera selection and, and was delighted that she was uh, so knowledgeable as to have the Ballad of Baby Doe in her record collection. It, it was a friendship that went beyond professionalism. And, and I dearly miss him. And that friendship is, is more than a legacy because there, there are times when one gets angry, one gets distrustful, one, gets, one sees things, one listens to rumors. And if that happens within my knowledge of the Jewish community, it's always Judah who brings me back to a center, to an understanding, to a realistic view of life. 
He was that kind of person. And, and for he and his colleagues to have created this archives is, is more than a mitzvah. It's a miracle. <coughs> Judah, though, the thing I remember is when we got to know each other, his office in Federation downtown, uh, he said, I want to show you something. And, and he opened a drawer. Oops. And he pulled this out. That is the Allsbacher document. That is the container of the letter that I read to you at the beginning of this presentation. That is the ethical testament that came to Cleveland in 1839 and survived all these years. To me, the Allsbacher document is, yes, it's a Jewish document, but to me, it's a universal human document. It talks about what happens to us when we move, when we change place, when we're forced to go someplace else, when we leave the graves of our ancestors. It's a universal immigrant story. And human beings are migrants and immigrants. We have populated the world by moving around the world. And so that story resonated with me as, as an immigration story. And when that document was then transferred to the Western Reserve Historical Society, that said something to me. We are a secular institution and the Jewish community has placed its trust, big word, trust in us. And that document, so one of the things that happens when you work with these, these remarkable things, sometimes you take them, I know where the Ellsbacher document is, where it is in the vault, I can go and see it. I was preparing for this talk and I was pulling out slides and I had, if I can change religious uh, uh, language here, I had an epiphany. Because <laughs> I had found a picture of this. This is the building that was the synagogue, the shul in Unslaven. These are the original doors to the shul. And that epiphany was, I understand this document, but now it becomes real because perhaps it was handed over to Moses Alsbacher within the synagogue, and perhaps he walked through these doors with that. This is the passage to a Cleveland legacy that begins a story here. But it's one stop on a larger story that starts with the diaspora. And the diaspora is here with us and has helped reshape this community. That's why I'm honored to be here tonight. I've been able to be a part of something remarkable that's happened for the Jewish community of Cleveland and for the Western Reserve Historical Society. Thank you. deep gratitude to Dr. Grabowski and his colleagues from the Western Reserve Historical Society. Thank you. I, I, I will never get home tonight. No, Bob's going to drive me right now. I also want to say thank you again to our sponsor, Bernstein Global Wealth Management. And I do want to urge you uh, Dr. Grabowski and his colleagues brought us some very important um, documents and uh, part of the collection from the Western Reserve Historical Society. You are invited to look at it, to touch it with white gloves, because these are very, very special uh, pieces from the collection. So I invite you to do that. And as a final reminder, if you have not created your Jewish legacy, our development staff is here to help you do that. <laughs> I had to say it, it's written here. No, but seriously, um, I think we are all very, very impressed with uh, the various ways that a legacy is created. And uh, one very important way is through the Jewish Community Federation. So I urge you to consider that. And thank you all very, very much for coming this evening. Are we supposed to look over? But that's something that I should like to see. Four Schoenberg and two sisters. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>